Let me just turn that off. That's weird. There you go. I'm back. Sorry about that. I don't know what that noise. So today is the infamous pious stream. So if you guys remember, uh, we have went through most of his early life. We have went through his life as <clears throat> a seminarian, a parish priest, as a bishop, as patriarch and cardinal. We went over all of... Um, We've went over his election to the papacy and the whole conclave controversy that, that went down during his election. And then now, Pius is Pope. So today what we're going to look at is we're going to look at some of the central aims of his papacy from the beginning, from of some of the first encyclicals that he released to see what Pius wanted to do to begin with. So before we get into that... Do not forget to look down below. Uh, make sure you click that like. Make sure you comment something for that algorithm. And then look at all of those links I have below. So you're going to find Patreon, patreon.com slash militantomist. If you would like to help out, um, I would really appreciate it. Also, uh, social media, if you want to find me on social media, if you already don't follow me there. The Discord you're going to find there. Then you're also going to find some of the books that I reprint. If you want to read uh, some of the same works that were written under Pius's pontificate and were approved by his cardinals. So that's that's interesting. Uh, and that's all I can think of. So let's get right into it. So when it comes to Pius's entire sort of mindset, Pius's, if Pius's whole goal for his pontificate Actually, from when he was a parish priest to a bishop to a patriarch, if you want to just sum up Pius's entire goal in life, it was to restore all things in Christ. That was his Episcopal motto, that he was going to restore all things in Christ. He was going to restore family life. He was going to restore the state. He was going to restore the church. He was going to restore the schools. He was going to restore everything. Um, in Christ, is that's what you can see as the one phrase which permeated St. Pius X's entire goal in life. So throughout his pontificate, he focused very strongly on zealous prayer, the formation of a, of a pious and learned priesthood, the catechesis of children, the religious instruction of adults, relief of the poor, keeping the commandments, and then especially a renewed love for and frequent use of the sacraments and liturgical renewal when it came to sacred music. That's just as a, in a nutshell, what Pius's goals were for his papacy. So at this point in his life, he, as we had said before, was a very disciplined man in order to carry out all the duties that he needed to do as Pope. 
And it said that even when he was 68 years old, so 68 is when he started his papacy, he still did what he always had done. He rose early. He had an hours, uh, an hour of meditation and recited uh, his offices. And then he said mass, which he usually got done at about six o'clock. So he was waking up extremely early to, to do all of his duties. So after he had done all of the work he needed to do, uh, he again uh, spent a very long time in prayer after he had done everything he needed to do. So he was a very disciplined man. Uh, that's, that's an important thing for us to remember about Pius's life and in our own life too, is that a lot of us, especially at uh, the age in which most of my, my audience is, the age of which many of you guys are, uh, you, you don't have good discipline, but Pius always made it a, a central focus from the time he was a seminarian, as we went over how his life was as a seminarian. Uh, he was an extremely disciplined man who always uh, counted his time because he knew that he had a limited space of time. He was, he was a person who was very, he was always aware of the fact of death. And the fact that he didn't have all of the time in the world. He didn't want to lose any time in his life. He always was very uh, strictly working. And then also uh, strictly resting is something which he, he partook in. But he always made sure he was disciplined with prayer first. And then second with study. As those are two things he was that he put a huge amount of importance on. So when it comes to his early days of his pontificate, he spent the time acquainting himself with how the government of the church worked because he was a cardinal before that, but being a pope is a bit different. You're in charge of a lot more branches. So he found out all of the issues that needed reform from a very early uh, time in his pontificate. So you see a clear vision which is developing uh, from those very early days. And he showed himself in these early days to be a great diplomat and leader. He saw the issues presented to him. He was able to uh, get down to the, get, get down below the surface to the central issues which were present, the center, the sort of broad strokes which were, which were present in every single issue that was per, uh, presented to him, and then be able to apply all of those years of prudence that he had acquired uh, working in the various aspects of his life. And then he was absolutely inflexible when it came to when he knew uh, when he knew something was an error or when he knew something needed to be done is he, he saw the issue, analyzed the issue, and then gave his response, then stuck to it. That, that, that's just how Pius worked, which made him a very effective leader. So the first, I'm going to go over four central focuses of his papacy uh, that I think are going to sum up a lot of a lot of his encyclicals, and then a lot of a lot of what he had a lot of what he had focused on throughout his own uh, th through throughout his own entire life. A lot of these. So the first one, uh, which we had already covered in his life as a parish priest and then as bishop and patriarch was the restoration of sacred music. Man, that candle is so strong. <coughs> I hate that candle. So he, he understood that in order for the recovery of the piety of the people, and then in order for the recovery of the sacredness of the mass, and in order to worship God with all of the honor which was due to his name, that there needed to be a recovery primarily of Gregorian chant. And uh, I actually, one time I went to a, a mass for the Society of uh, uh, Pius X. And I had, I had opened up one of the, uh, the hymnals uh, and I saw a quote from Giuseppe Sarto which it was Cardinal Giuseppe Sarto is what the quote was from. And I was like, well, that's, that's Pius X. I know who that is. And it was a quote. And he said that his, that this was him writing as a Cardinal, but that his main aim was that the people would be able to chant the Pater and the Credo and the Agnus Dei. 
is that was his main aim. And then if he just was able to recover that, then he would be completely happy with his reform. So that is something which Pius focused on heavily was the bringing again um, of the participation of the laity in the in, in the chant of the church and not all of this um, sort of extravagant performance that you that you see in some of the insane sort of uh, Mozart masses and stuff like that. He, he was he was very focused on while those have their place that that wasn't supposed to be the uh, the, the central food of the people of God. And this was seen, especially in his day is a, I think, I think we, I think I mentioned this before, but the issue that was that the issue that he was facing, especially in Italy, that he had to fight a lot of people on was opera singers. What would happen is they would basically have a cantor who was a famous opera singer and the opera singer would be the one who would chant all the all the propers, and it was completely uh, unintelligible. It was impossible to follow when it came to the laity, and he decided that they just needed to get rid of get rid of opera singers um, completely. So this was a huge fight, though is a lot of the Italians really loved having opera singers at mass. They said, well, it sounds pretty. And he said, no, 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 this is not the purpose of the mass. We need to absolutely uh, get rid of this secular sort of music that is being brought into the household of God. We need to completely just, just excise it. That and a huge problem he had with opera singers is the fact that opera singers are usually females. The fact that most opera singers are women. And when you have women who are participating in the liturgy, that is not okay. That is not okay because the cantor is a sacerdotal office just as much as the priest is a sacerdotal office. Obviously a different uh, degree, but it's still uh, offering up sacrifice unto God. So you can't have women uh, participate in either as the cantor or be part of the choir. You just can't have it. So that was a huge point for Pius X is to say, get all these women out of the liturgy. Just get them out. Uh, they, they, they don't belong there. This, these are sacred offices which are representing the priesthood of Jesus Christ. So they do not belong here. So that was a, a huge sticking point for Pius is he was he, he wouldn't budge on this. He would always uh, get rid of one, the secular music and then two the women. So I think a lot of our parishes could also uh, could also use that reform, too. So in order to fight this battle, he finally issued a motu proprio on this matter. And I'm just going to pull it up because this is such a such a good this is one of my favorite um, one of my favorite encyclicals that I have ever read is I, I love this one. It's his instruction on sacred music. This is this is really good. Anybody, I'm just going to read the the introduction because the introduction uh, is is just amazing. But if you want to, uh, if you want to, you should just read it on your own. The whole thing. I'm just going to send it. Is that Morbius in the background? Gosh darn it! The, every time I have the other Paul on here, he puts Morbius in the background. There you go. He always does it. I'm going to send the send the link down there. Okay. So his instructional on sacred music, general. Well, I'm not going to read the general principles. I'm just going to read the the introduction because it's really good. Among the cares of the pastoral office, not only of the supreme chair, which we, though unworthy, occupy through the inscrutable dispositions of providence, but of every local church, a leading one is without question that of maintaining and promoting the decorum of the house of God in which the august mysteries of religion are celebrated and where the Christian people assemble to receive the grace of the sacraments, to assist at the holy sacrifice of the altar, to adore the most august sacrament of the Lord's body, and to unite in the common prayer of the church and the public and solemn liturgical offices. Nothing should have place, therefore, in the temple calculated to disturb or even merely to diminish 
the piety and devotion of the faithful. Nothing that may give reasonable cause for disgust or scandal. Nothing, above all, which directly offends the decorum and sanctity of the most sacred functions, and is thus unworthy of the house of prayer and of the majesty of God. We do not touch separately on the abuses in this matter that which may arise. Today our attention is directed to one of the most common of them, one of the most difficult to eradicate, and the existence of which is sometimes to be deplored in places where everything else is deserving of the highest praise. The beauty and sumptuousness of the temple, the splendor and the accurate performance of the ceremonies, the attendance of the clergy, the gravity and piety of the officiating ministers, such as the abuse affecting sacred chant and music. And indeed, whether it is owing to the very nature of this art, fluctuating and variable as it is in itself, or to the succeeding changes in tastes and habits with the course of time, or to the fatal influence exercised on sacred art by profane and theatrical art. So, hmm, I wonder if I can think of any uh, any liturgies I've ever been who have uh, who have engaged in profane and theatrical art, or to the pleasure that music directly produces and that is not always easily contained within the right limits, or finally to the many prejudices on this matter, so lightly introduced and tenaciously maintained, even among respectable, responsible, and pious persons. The fact remains that there is a general tendency to deviate from the right rule prescribed by the end, for which the art is admitted to the severe service of public worship, and which is set forth very clearly in the ecclesiastical canons, in the ordinances of the general and provincial councils, in the prescriptions which have at various times amen, uh, amen, emanated, sorry, I can't read, emanated from the sacred Roman congregations and from our predecessors, the sovereign pontiffs. It is with real satisfaction that we acknowledge the large amount of good that has been affected in this respect during the last decade in our fostering city of Rome and in many churches in our country, but in a more special way among some nations in which illustrious men full of zeal for the worship of God have with the approval of the Holy See under the direction of the bishops united in flourishing societies and restored sacred music to the fullest honor in all their churches and chapels. Still the good work which has been done is very far indeed from being common to all. When we consult our own personal experience and take into account the great number of complaints that have reached us during the short time that have elapsed since it pleased the Lord to elevate our humility to the supreme summit of the, of the Roman pontificate, we consider it our first duty without further delay to raise our voice at once in reproof and condemnation of all that is seen to be out of harmony with the right rule above indicated in the functions of public worship and the performance of the ecclesiastical offices. Filled as we are with the most earnest desire to see the true Christian spirit flourish in every respect and be preserved by all the faithful, we deem it necessary to provide before anything else for the sanctity and dignity of the temple in which the faithful assemble for no other object than that of acquiring the spirit from its foremost and indispensable font, which is the active participation in the most holy mysteries and in the public and solemn prayer of the church. And it is vain to hope that the blessing of heaven will descend abundantly upon us when our homage to the Most High, instead of ascending in the odor of sweetness, puts into the hand of the Lord the scourges wherewith of old the divine Redeemer drove the unworthy profaners from the temple. Hence, in order that no, no one for the future may be able to plead an excuse that he did not clearly understand his duty, and that all vagueness may be eliminated from the interpretation of matters which have been already commanded. We have deemed it expedient to point out briefly the principles, notice principles, regulating sacred music and the functions of public worship, and to gather together in a general survey the principal prescriptions of the church, notice, 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 this is going to be important, against the more common abuses in this subject. We therefore publish, mode proprio, and with certain knowledge, our present instruction to which, as to a juridical code of sacred music, we will with fullness of our apostolic authority that the force of law be given. And we do, by our present handwriting, impose its scrupulous observance on all. Now notice, these are going to be, I, I want you guys to notice when it comes to, when it comes to this mode proprio, this, this isn't a game of archaeologism. Uh, 
ar- ar- would it be archaeologism? Is that it's like some some sort of archaeological? Like I'm gonna dig up my like really old uh, sort of practices, and I'm just gonna bring it back. This this is not what he's doing. He's not concerned with the date in which music was written. He doesn't care whether somebody wrote a piece like two years before his pontificate. He doesn't care that, that those can be used. It's not with modern music um, or at least uh, modern dates on music that he's concerned with. What he's concerned with in this encyclical and what we all need to be concerned with is those eternal principles wherein sacred music is to be judged. A piece could be from the third century and be inappropriate for sacred music. A piece could be from the 21st century and be perfectly appropriate for sacred music. Rather, what we need to do is read those principles, which he sets down, which he does. And then he prudently applies those principles to the certain situation in which he was and which he was in. So what he did here is he uh, he laid down definitive rules. And one of those one of those central rules, again, I'm going to say it again, one of those central rules is that he got rid of the practice of bringing in paid and professional singers. That's not appropriate for the worship of God, having paid and professional singers to to do whatever. It isn't okay to have a a, jazz mass with a jazz band. That's not okay. And uh, especially he got rid of women. Uh, Women were not to be in the choir. Women were not to... Not, not to be a cantor. You, you can't have your opera singers in there. No, no women, no women at all. Because of, again, the sacerdotal function of sacred music, which he's going to outline, and he did outline in the preface to that encyclical. Very important. And then also he got rid of uh, bands and orchestras, um, bands and orchestras, um, the, the sort of um, the, the, the accompaniments that were that were given in sacred music that's just not appropriate for sacred music to have again your jazz band or your your uh, your youth rock band or to have even uh even in his day which would have been like a full-on sort of like classical uh orchestra in order to accompany your mass that's just not appropriate when it comes to sacred music uh just just get the get all that garbage out of here that's just not appropriate um as as he proves and outlines um in this and then hassan hassan i think i saw him in the comments earlier he has a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff on this oh there he is oh yeah hassan definitely he has a lot of good encyclicals and stuff on uh on this from from church history so uh and then uh, you, you see somebody who who somebody summed up pious's belief on this and wrote in an ecclesiastical review, and this is kind of a funny quote. He says, uh, you have Miss A singing duets with Miss B to the words Domine Fili Jesu Christi, as if they were singing There's Life in the Old Horse Yet, and to music which would disgrace a 10th rate writer of music hall songs. Or if you, or if it be a male choir, you hear thunderous ba- uh, basses without a note in tune and emasculated tenors engaged over worrying the most solemn words of the creed as though they were prize dogs in the creed a pack of rats we need some, we need somebody to write something like that but about like the average uh the average like really cringe um local parish that you that you go to so uh a second focus and this is going to be a bit of a uh a bit of a a less controversial note is going to be his second focus was on the poor is he was very devoted to the service of the poor. Uh, And he released a mode proprio in this in 1903, which I'm not going to read the introduction to that. Um, It's it's pretty well known. Uh, But when it comes to his devotion for the poor, we have to remember that he had a personal background when it comes to being poor. His, His entire family was poor, as we saw in the first episode of this about his childhood. Uh, his, his parents were poor. Uh, he, his siblings were poor. Every, everybody was poor. He grew up in a small town. So he was very concerned when it came to caring for the poor. And he, he struck again, that, that sort of medium that we need to strike when it comes to our view of the poor. And he was a wonderful exponent of Catholic social teaching. So first he would condemn the abusive tendencies of the capitalists. And then he would also condemn the extreme tendencies of the radical socialists. And um, it, somebody somebody summarized 
uh, in a pretty good way, the, the belief of pious on this. So I'm just going to read this. After having laid down the fundamental inequality of the different members of society and man's right to use and permanent ownership of property. So notice inequality um, of different members of society and man's right to use and ownership of property is not wrong. This is where we're going to condemn the socialists. He passed on the obligations of justice between masters and men and the utility of aid societies and trade unions. Christian democracy, he maintained. This is an American writer who's writing this, so ignore democracy. Christian democracy, he maintained, had for its special aim the solution of the difficulties between labor and capital. But in order to do this effectively, it must be based on the principles of the Catholic faith and morality. It must not be made use of for party purposes. It must be a beneficent, bene, beneficent, sorry, I can't pronounce anything, activity in favor of the people founded on the natural law and the precepts of the Gospels. Catholic writers, when upholding the cause of the people and the poor, were to beware of using language calculated to inspire ill feeling between the classes. Again, condemning the class warfare of the socialists. Here, as in other manners, obedience to the law of God and of the church were to be the means of the solution of many difficulties which, um, which existed. And what you're going to see is that his solution, Pius's solution to restoring all things in Christ in this situation, was to assert the supremacy of the church and the need for explicitly Catholic states is that's the only thing which is going to solve us in, in, in this crisis of the poor. He wrote, quote, to reinstate Jesus Christ in the family, the school, and society, to reestablish the principle that human authority represents that of God, to take intimately to heart the interests of the people, especially those of the working and agricultural classes, to endeavor to make public laws conformable to justice, to amend or suppress those which are not so, to defend and support the rights of God in everything and the no less sacred rights of the church. That is, that is how we get out of the problems we have with the poor and with everything. It's not through all of this uh, garbage about, I, I don't know, what, what new thing people, people want um, in order to solve the solution of the poor. They're all dumb ideas. The only smart idea is Pius's idea, which is to defend and support the rights of God and of the church. That's the only way. And his mindset in this, um, in, in in the sort of uh, restoring all of those different aspects, the family, school, society, the state, the church, and restoring everything in Christ. What you're going to find is uh, there's an interesting uh, anecdote from, from his life, is that when he was pope, there was a woman who had come up uh, and asked Pius what she can do for the church, how she can service the church the best. And you know what Pius said? Pius didn't say to, to go up and uh, do all these important apostolates. He didn't say to uh, to, to go and be my career woman uh, doing all this stuff. He didn't say to uh, to do all of these wonderful things and to like start like making YouTube channels where you speak against all of uh, all of the abuses of the hierarchy. Now, there's places for each one of those except the career woman thing that never should be a place. There's places for uh, for the other things, but his his answer to the woman was very very simple. What he said is, "Teach the catechism to your kids." That's all he said. Teach the catechism. That's that's how you restore the church. Have kids, teach them the catechism. That 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 is how you restore the church to be faithful within any vocation you have. If you're a if you're a single man, it means to pray and study the faith. Um, to excel in piety and in good works. If you are more learned, it might be to teach others the faith, to defend the faith and guard the faith from the um, from the wicked uh, sort of attacks that we get from the, the Protestant horde. If you're a mother, it's to raise, nurture, and teach your kids in the faith. If you're a father, it's to rule your household with justice and to make sure your family excels in piety and in prayer. That that is what it looks like to restore all things in Christ to everybody in their own <clears throat> in their own various aspects and duties and vocations in life to just perform them um, in a pious manner.
that, that, that all it is. It's very, it's very simple. If everybody is just minding um, their own vocation, if every Catholic family in this country just taught their kids the catechism and uh, made sure they did a family rosary, it would, the, all of America would be converted in a few decades. That, that, that's all it is, is if the, it's those simple things that need to be carried out before you think about all of the great and the complex things. The great and the complex things, they can they can wait for other people. But first and foremost, you just need to carry out your vocation as a Catholic wherever you have been placed. That's all it is. So a third aspect. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, my throat is just... I don't know. I think I'm getting sick. So a third aspect is Pius's love for sacred scripture is that's going to be another perennial principle, which is going to be brought forth by Pius is that he is going to say that we need to have a, a sort of ressourcement of, of the study of sacred scripture uh, uh, with, within the, within the tradition of, within the tradition of Thomistic theology. For, for Pius, he's pretty explicit about that, is he's going to study scripture within the gates which are placed for him uh, by the magisterium and then by uh, the school in which he clearly adheres to. So he continued uh, the patronage that Leo XIII had for sacred, script, uh, sacred scripture. If you remember, Leo XIII uh, was a huge fan of sacred scripture and established the Society of St. Jerome. So uh, for the translation and interpretation of scripture, which is something that Pius X continued to continue to support. And really, in order to get get Pius's love for sacred scripture, all you need to do is read his encyclicals. What you'll get in every single one of his encyclicals is you're just going to give that that uh, constant permeation of the sacred books of the Old and New Testament just throughout all of his all of his encyclicals. It's just everywhere. And this is really a, uh, uh, you're, you're going to get, uh, I'll actually deal with an objection real quick. What you're going to get from the Protestants, and it's kind of funny, is is the one of uh, four, I was reading Forbes' biography on Pius. And Forbes is like, yeah, this really shows uh, shows our separated brother and uh, how how dumb they are when they say that uh, that we don't like scripture. Like, just look at Pius X. It's kind of funny. He was he was just going off about like, yeah, we we love sacred scripture too. Look at Pius X. He was he was a big fan. And uh, you guys are you guys are you, you guys are wrong when it comes to the the way in which you're interpreting him. But what you're going to get from Protestants is a very famous quote, actually, from Pius X. It's from his catechism. And in his catechism, he says that when it comes to those, those Bibles which have been given to you from Protestants, what are you supposed to do with them? And he answers that you're supposed to take them to your parish priest to be burned. So the the Protestant is going to object. Well, actually, it seems like Pius X was just trying to hide the Bible from all the laity. But this is actually the exact opposite of the truth. Uh, under his pontificate, you had just tens of thousands of copies of sacred scripture, which filled households. The real issue, the real issue you're going to run into is the fact that he wanted to make sure is following the example of St. Peter to highlight the fact that scripture is often difficult to read and it can be twisted to one's own destruction. So he was concerned for the fact that there needed to be notes in in sacred scripture. There needed to be these notes which were able to um, which were able to explain the difficulties which were found in the text of sacred scripture. So that's all he was concerned about. He wasn't just saying like oh nobody should read scripture just like memorize my catechism um, which, which ironically, Luther did call his catechism the scripture of the laity, but uh, that, that's all I'm saying. Um, but when it comes to when it comes to Pius, he was totally a, he was a huge fan of sacred scripture and especially of the reading of sacred scripture um, in every single household. That it was that it was a good thing as long as you kept and made sure that you had the notes, approved notes from the church in there to 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 stay safe when it comes to your reading of scripture. 
to not fall into the heresy of the Protestants. So a fourth aspect is I thought this was a this was an interesting one that everybody would love is that Pius was a huge, huge, huge fan of physical education. He was a huge fan of exercise ever since uh, his seminary days. He had been a very active, very active guy. He just he just loved exercise. Um, he he wrote. Quote, I approve of your gymnastics, your cycle, boat, and foot races, your mountain climbing, and the rest. For these pastimes will keep you from the idleness, which is the mother of every vice. And because friendly contests will be for you the symbol of emulation and the practice of virtue. Be strong to keep and defend your faith when so many are losing it. Be strong to remain devoted sons of the church when so many are rebelling against her. Be strong to conquer all the obstacles which you will meet in the practice of Catholic religion for your own merit and for the good of your brothers. So he was he was a huge fan of, of physical education. So I think Pius would, would love Catholic lifter culture is the fact that you have traditional and Orthodox Catholics who love who love both sacred liturgy and lifting. I think uh, I think Pius would be a huge fan of of lifter culture. Catholic lifter culture, that is. So that's all I have for you. Thank you for watching. And I'll probably be coming out with the next part in about two weeks. So I'm also doing that series on certainty. So remember, it's Trinity Tide, and we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in Unity.